Beyond Resilience is a series of curated conversations created by Firelight uh, with the purpose of exploring the challenges, strategies, and experiences of creating and distributing work during a time of crisis. Nobody's going to give us any power until we ask for it, until we demand it. The role of storytellers right now is to tell those stories that people are refusing to tell and to do so in a transparent manner. It is critical to me that my team, again, reflect the community that we are going to be talking about or the community that is the subject. There are so many missing narratives in the Black experience that would do so much to help both the understanding of Black people in our current situation, but also other people who are trying to understand what's going on. The decision makers need to change. Um, it is not okay that this small group of white folks are the ones who determine which stories matter, which filmmakers matter, and, and just decide and set the terms on which these stories are made. That is literally what has gotten us to the place that we are in. We're talking about systemic change, you know, not a one-time grant to, to, uh, to, you know, a couple of organizations. That, that, that's what we need. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. My name is Marcia Smith. I'm the president and co-founder of Firelight Media. I am uh, sitting in a black chair with blue rimmed glasses, a uh, black tailored shirt with a uh, aqua blue scales on it. It's a lovely shirt. It's new. <clears throat> We'd like to start with a land acknowledgement to raise awareness of indigenous presence and land rights. We all have a responsibility to consider what it means to acknowledge the history and the legacy of colonialism. I am coming to you from Harlem, New York, on the land of the Muncie Lenape people. And we encourage you to make your own land acknowledgements if you can drop them in the chat. And I'm gonna ask one of my colleagues to also drop a link in there in case there are any of you listening who would like to do some more research on the land that you are currently on. <clears throat> As we begin today's event, I want to call our attention to the horrific violence that took place in Atlanta last week. Violence that specifically targeted Asian American women. The Atlanta murders stand at, as the most agonizing, but far from the only incident of violence, harassment, and scapegoating that the Asian American and Pacific Islander community has faced in recent years, but particularly during the COVID-19 pandemic, when racist language was used and promoted by some of the most powerful people in the country. Words have consequences. Language shape shapes actions. We all have a role to play in building a culture and a language that values all, that honors all, and that gives no quarter to racism. During and after today's event, we'll share the names of organizations that are working to stop acts of racist hate against the AAPI community. One place to start is Red Canary Song, a grassroots collective of Asian and migrant sex workers organizing transnationally. Firelight Media stands in solidarity with the AAPI community and is committed to continuing to lift up Asian American and Pacific Islander filmmakers, artists, and communities through our programs as, as we have done for the past decade. The filmmakers and artists who join us today, I'm thrilled about this group, Kiara Lacey, Ligaya Romero, and Maya Cruz Palileo all use their work to highlight the history and culture of their families, people, and communities. Support for filmmakers and artists to tell their own stories on their own terms is at the core of Firelight's mission. We're proud to continue that mission today, and we thank you for joining us. Before I turn over this afternoon's event to our moderator, the wonderful Chloe Walters Wallace. I want to say just a few words about Firelight Media. Firelight is a premier source of and support for nonfiction cinema by and about BIPOC communities. 
Our programs include the Documentary Lab, an 18-month fellowship that supports emerging filmmakers of color, Groundwork Regional Lab, which supports early stage filmmakers in the American South, Midwest, and US territories, and the William Greaves Fund, a development grant fund for mid-career BIPOC filmmakers. By the way, the Greaves Fund is now open and accepting applications. So those of you who are interested, please uh, check it out on our website, which is firelightmedia.tv. Our co-founder, Stanley Nelson, and our sister production company, Firelight Films, have garnered multiple Emmys, Peabody's, and Sundance Awards, among many others. Our latest film, Crack, Cocaine, Corruption, and Conspiracy, is now streaming worldwide on Netflix. And you can also catch, for those of you who have been watching Judas and the Black Messiah, you can see Stanley's film, The Black Panthers, Vanguard of the Revolution in a variety of places right now. We'd like to thank Open Society Foundations for their sponsorship of Beyond Resilience and the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs and the National Endowment of the Arts for their support of Beyond Resilience as well. Now, to continue this afternoon's program, I'm going to turn over the event to Chloe Walters Wallace, who was Firelight's Manager of Artist Programs. In addition to supporting Firelight's flagship documentary lab, Chloe heads up our Groundwork Regional Lab, which aims to expand the pipeline of emerging diverse makers from the South, Midwest, and US territories. And she's also a filmmaker. In 2017, Chloe produced Woke, a narrative feature infused with mental and sexual health messaging for young people, preceded by the feature documentary Backstory. Chloe has also served on selection committees, co committees for the National Endowment for the Arts, Create Louisiana, Creative Capital, the Center for Asian American Media, Real South, Kukulores Works in Progress Lab, Doc Society's New Perspectives Fund, the IDA Documentary Awards, and TFI's If Then Short Documentary Program. You get the idea. Chloe was recently named a 2021 Rockwood Just Films Fellow. So now I'd like to turn the program over to Chloe Walters Wallace. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you, Marsha, for that lovely introduction. Um, I am really excited to be here and to uh, present to you um, two shorts from our wonderful um, In the Making series, which features eight cinematic and character driven shorts by emerging BIPOC filmmakers, most of whom have graduated from the documentary lab. In the Making, uh, in partnership with American Masters, explores the artistic process of up and coming creatives through nonfiction storytelling. Um, I'm really, really excited to also introduce again Lagaya and Kiara later on. Uh, I want to just describe what I, where I'm sitting and where I'm sitting, what I'm sitting in front of. I'm wearing a black top, um, gold hoops in front of a white rattan sofa and in front of a blue and white doorway. Um, there is an ice cream man running by my <laughs> on my uh, street. Um, so I'm really, really excited to share these films with you. We'll be sharing two different projects, two different short films, um, one after the other. First up, we have Maya Cruz Paleleo, Becoming the Moon, directed by Legaya Romero. Enjoy. Thank you so much, um, Lagaya and Maya. That was beautiful. Um, next, I'm, I'm going to need the playlist, by the way, Lagaya, for that short. Um, next up, we'll have Jamaica, Yoli, Osorio, This is the Way We Rise, directed by Kiara Lacey. Um, it's quite a treat. Enjoy. Thank you both. Thank you, Kiara and Jamaica for the gorgeous, gorgeous work. Um, I'm very, very, very thrilled to invite up um, Maya, Ligaya, and Kiara, our panelists for today, to come share their experiences and their work. Welcome. Aloha. <laughs> 
Hi, um, everyone. So I'm going to start. Yes. Hello. <laughs> I'm going to start off with a question for Kiara and Lagaya. Um, as everyone might know or might not know, In the Making is the latest installment or series of Firelight's Digital Shorts Commission's work. Um, we put a lot of uh, care and love back into our alumni through commissioning sh digital short films. Um, and I wanted to ask, uh, the way this works is that you had to pitch um, who you wanted to feature in your digital short, and I'd love to know why you chose to work with Maya and Jamaica? What about their work inspired you or brought you to this place to create some work? Um, Kiara, do you want to start since you're off mute? Sure. Um, Hawaiian in terms of a language is incredibly poetic. So if you listen to Hawaiian music, um, everything in Hawaiian music is a metaphor or like an analogy using nature for a variety of things. So there's a lot of symbolism in our language. And I, um, I secretly am also a fan of slam poetry. I love the performance and the poetry combined. And, you know, I'm not the person with words, but I can um, love on and respect the person who does that. And I, I've been following Jamaica's work for a while and just waiting for the right moment. And when this opportunity came up, I was like, what a great way to introduce something that feels really culturally relevant you know, as a Hawaiian poet, um, but in a really updated way. So it's a way to like express Hawaiian culture outside of the more traditional arts, which are still important, but really expand what people see um, Hawaiians as. And there's just such fire behind her words. So I felt like not only would you be able to experience her poetry, but she'd also be able to give you a framework to experience it, um, which is really helpful too. Yes, um, I love telling this story, but when I first saw Maya's work, um, uh, it was part of her show in Red Hook at Pioneer Works. And it was one of the first times that I felt like, um, that I saw so specifically my experience as a queer Filipinx person within the diaspora mirrored back at me um, in paintings. And to the point where I thought, you know, I would look at Maya's paintings and I'd be like, this person looks like my mom, this person looks like my sister, you know, like the faces were just so familiar. Um, so when I saw that, you know, the, the open call for pitches, specifically highlighting artists, I knew exactly who I wanted to reach out to. Um, I sent like a really nerdy fanboy like <laughs> email to Maya to be like, hey, I really love your work. Would you come talk to me? So Maya was so gracious um, in inviting me over to her studio for pizza to talk about the project. Um, and I think what was another added layer of just like for me, what felt like you know, destiny or, or like, you know, the, um, the, the potential for a magical collaboration was that um, Maya was also looking at um, like the history of colonial imagery or the way that cameras had been used to, to control and oppress our people. Um, so the, but also creating work that existed outside of that, right, that existed in, in, in the realm of magical realism and our folklore and our, and our family memories. So I thought that not only did I love her work, not only did I really vibe with her, but um, the themes in her work were themes that I myself was thinking about and wanted to explore in, in my films. So it was like super easy <laughs> to pick. That is fantastic. Um, Maya, next to you, I'd love to hear about your trajectory of your practice. You know, did you start with focusing on these themes or did you start with painting or was it something else? Just love to hear all about how you came to be in the work that you're doing. Thanks, Chloe. I'm so happy to be here. I just feel like everything is so fierce and I'm so happy to be here. Um, yeah, I actually, I started in art uh, in high school. I took a photography class and uh, my dad um, did some photography when he was there and he kind of knew about it and I made a camera and I was really just fell in love with photography. And then, um, and when I went to away to college, they didn't have a photography department. <laughs> so I ended up in the fine art um, department and um, 
you know, it's funny because I, I actually went to school for sculpture um, and I became a painter sort of secretly uh, and then later on. So um, yeah, and I, and I was making work that was inspired by my family. Um, as you all know from the film, I was really thinking about memory and loss um, to begin with you know, losing my mother and, and just be, being really curious about her and her life and who she was and where they, where she came from, where she grew up, all of that stuff. I was always curious about that. And I was really, really close with my grandmother, my Lola, who told me a lot of stories growing up. So I was kind of obsessed with my grandma. And <laughs> so that's kind of where it started. It started in the family. And then as I continued to, to do research, you know, I was curious about, you know, I had a family archive that went up to about the 1940s, but I didn't have anything. To be. So when I was doing that research, it just opened up, you know, I learned about um, the Philippine American War, the whole history between the two countries, did to really give context to all of those stories that I grew up um, hearing in many different ways. And I think it was, a lot of it wasn't just good and bad it was kind of everything in between um so that's so yeah so then i went to um chicago or study to look at the photographs the aquanial photographs but in that i was also reading um uh, short stories and um and folklore and also thinking about the story the family oral histories that i heard just started to develop in that direction um, and, you know, it, it just kind of went from there. It's, it's really amazing because I didn't really have um, much of a, a Filipino community um, until I started making my work. And um, I've just been meeting a lot of people through the work. So I, I, I just, I feel like just trying to follow, follow the work has, has led to um, so much eye-opening uh, connections and inspiring connections. Thank you, Maya. Um, I'm going to direct a question back to Kiara, just kind of also moving into mediums as well. You know, poetry is not a visual medium. So I'm really struck by the way that you describe um, Jamaica's poetry and how that is then overlaid onto how you've created your film. You know, I was really taken with how you're enmeshing both word, her, um, their voice, their energy and experience of writing as well, the connection to the land. Um, and it's all kind of manifested in this work. So I, I can you talk about what your artistic vision was to create it? I think we started off, I usually pick one thing, I'm very simple. So I was like, what's one thing that we can do to and focus on to translate the poetry on screen? And I always think of poetry as being non-binary. It's like that you can take two things that don't necessarily belong together and create new meaning with it. Um, and it just, it just felt so right. And like, it's truthful for Jamaica as well. And so I was like, let's split screen the shit out of it. Oh, let's, let's split screen this thing. And I was like, that was just a very, like just one simple idea. Like if we split screen the film, then how can we, that gives us another opportunity to combine images and say something on top of it. So not only are we like hearing the poetry and then maybe seeing it graphically, but we're also expressing poetry in the way that we, that we um, visualize the film as well. Uh, and that was, yeah, it was a, it was a, it was a small idea that we kind of just stuck through and process wise, we built the film as like a linear narrative first, and then did a pass to split screen it. And I think it also gave us the opportunity to include a lot of like the natural imagery. So you could fall in love with the spaces you were seeing, um, in a way that was different. So, and just connect Jamaica to the land, you know, in a way that, um, the way that, in a way that we might not have been able to do. Um, so super, it was a really fun experience to kind of explore that. It was my first time working with split screen. So fun fact, we actually have almost like 45 to 50 minutes of content in the film that you see, even though it's like only 12 minutes because there's so much um, split screen work in it. If I was to lay out the film end to end, 
um, it would be really long. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Lagaya, the overarching theme that I took away from your film is both from Maya and as well as how you kind of taken this trajectory of this lineage of ferocity um, for us to be who we are and that necessity that we must be who we are um, and, and, and fold that into our identities. So that is also a part of the way you've stylistically created the piece, I felt. But you can tell me if I'm wrong. Um, I'd love to hear about also your artistic vision and how that kind of overarching theme is a part. Ooh, no, you are so right. And thank you for, um, you know, reading those themes into the film. And I'm so blown away, Kiara, by what you were saying about, you know, the non-binariness of poetry. And I think something that I was having difficulty with when I was structuring and editing the film is how do you take themes that are non-linear and put them into a linear timeline, right? In the I can't think, I, if you ever, I like, I do not think in, a timeline like my brain is all over the place so yes I understand. yes and I think that's you know to me I think that honors a lot of our cultural forms of storytelling right like we're thinking like like I wanted to be thinking in circles or like constellations or like you know like what is memory and 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 dream you know the interpretation of dreams like what kind of story three act structure you know does that fall into so um I say that because what I really love the challenge of trying to take all the different threads. It felt like weaving, right? So I, I wanted to be weaving in the edit. Um, and thank you so much, Chloe, for like using the word like ferocity, because that is something, yes, that like really came out, I think, in my, in getting to know Maya and her work, um, in being able to to travel to Michigan and see those archives, those actual glass negatives that you see in the film. You know, ferocity isn't something that I grew up thinking I had a lineage of, you know what I mean? I think that is the part of the, the violence of the model minority shit, you know, that it like shaves away our history of resistance, of rebellion, of, of ferocity. And then only in my like adult life am I now having to dig that up, dig and dig and try to remember that history and like what is already in our blood, right? Like our, our, our bodies remember it, but can our, can our heads remember it? Can our brains remember it? Um, so I guess that's, you know, that quote of, of um, from Maya's mother of like the purpose of life is to become who you are that really like struck me. And when Maya said that in the interview, I already knew. I was like, okay, I know where that's going in the film <laughs> because it just spoke to like where I was. And I feel like so many of us are right now is, is becoming who we are, remembering, right? Like who we are and our lineages. Um, that is a perfect segue into my next question, but I want to know if Kiara or Maya, you wanted to respond to what Maya um, Ligaya just shared. Uh, that was amazing. I'm just like, I can feel the like emotion like right behind my eyes. Um, yeah, you know, I think it's just also speaks to the power of art and film. And, you know, I mean, I honestly thought I was just gonna be making paintings of my aunties, like my great aunties in their garden, like in my studio in, isolation in perpetuity for the rest of my life but I was like I don't care I'm just gonna make these paintings because what else am I gonna do you know and um and I think that you know I, I just really really um appreciate that uh through these um opportunities or this you know to the call to even make these films um all of this is coming up from that I mean it's just so powerful and, and I you know I just wanted to say that and just to piggyback on this idea of ferocity, I think it's something that um, I, in my community, saw a lot of, like, there are a lot of really powerful women that I could see and, like, you know, model myself after, but whether or not that image has expanded outside of our community and whether or not people 
are aware of the history um, to have them understand the need for the power and the shift in who we are. You know, Hawaiians, we do start with aloha, right? Love, love and aloha are like, they're core to who we are, but that's, um, there is a responsibility and a respect to that as well. And I think breaking outside of um, the image that has been marketed about us worldwide is really powerful. And, you know, oh, Hawaiians, you've got aloha. Why would you be like, you know, why would you be fighting this or that? Or why are you causing trouble? You know, there's a lot of the, oh, Hawaiians just cause trouble. And it's, um, it's not that. It's because people don't, even in, as Hawaiians, don't realize the history, you know, our own history. And um, I find myself so often having to retell where we're coming from um, and what that, what that timeline has been to get us to where we are. So that when you see people protesting, it's not just troublemakers. It's, it's, it's with reason and it's justified. And you can have aloha, but also have that aloha and need to have the, um, the ferocity and the fight for your people. Thank you, Clara. I um, so I I feel like that gets put on on island people a lot because of this sort of imagery of what islands are supposed to be and what's supposed to happen there. So I really am very grateful to be amongst the three of you island folks as well. Um, it makes me it, I can't even talk about. It. Um, but I in saying that in talking about history. In both of your films, there are these uh, these uh, grappling with the colonialism of the land, and it's not lost on me, particularly the guy when you bring up the exoticization of um, Filipino women and American imperialism, and that connection to what happened in Georgia, the murders that happened in Georgia in the last few weeks, and how that's kind of part of and parcel of the manifestation of that violence. Um, but on the other side, this work and the, 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 the work of reassembling who we are and presenting that for the world is also a part of history and archive. So I want to, to hear from all of you about you know, what it means to create this work um, in moments of worldwide and specifically the community crisis in the AAPI community um, and just anything else you want to share about that. If I, if I could, um, I think when we talk about uh, moments of crisis or action, like it's important to me that as we access them, it's with power. Um, you know, my goal is always to give a sense of power to our community, um, even if they're, even if we're talking about pressure points or vulnerability. It's like we can we can speak about painful parts, but we can do it in a way that also offers us power. And I think it's not an ex there's it shouldn't be one or the other. I think you know we can kind of acknowledge both and push forward with both. Um, and I will say like, you know, watching the crisis with Mauna Kea, but also again, seeing the power of our community come together. You know, I, I walked away from it saying, it doesn't matter what happens. The outcome doesn't matter in some ways. I mean, obviously we want the best of the best, but like being able to see my people in a moment of collaboration like that was something I never thought I would see. It was crazy. In my wildest dreams, I don't think I ever would have, I, I don't think I ever would have thought I'd see something like that. The explosion online, like via social media and people just took to the streets. They just stand on the street corner and wave a sign by themselves in the middle of nowhere, just to do it, just to, just to have voice and to see that power. Like, I think that is, um, it's undeniable. And like, again, it doesn't matter what this outcome is, it's about the longer game. And if we as a community can find our sense of power in these moments, then like, that's the change that you can hope for, you know? And as we begin to see ourselves in positions of power, then we are powerful. Ooh, so much, so much power. Um, I'm getting a little emotional, so apologies in advance. Like this, you know, for all of us, this has been a really painful week, painful year. Um, 
I had to write some points down before the panel because I felt like in my emotional heightened emotional state I would forget but you know for me what I wanted to really uplift is that as storytellers we see how our stories have been stripped down and then used against us in service of white supremacy in service of capitalism so when I see people say stop Asian hate and then in the same breath say we need more police you know that to me that's an example of like twisting our stories right and so like we need storytellers and stories that uplift that in order to stop hate against Asian American and Pacific Islanders that means defund the police that means end white supremacy that we need to be in solidarity with our black and indigenous siblings and liberation movements. Um, that we have to understand the violence of last week in Atlanta at the massage parlor within the context of calling for the decriminalization of sex work and massage work. Um, that we need to understand it within the context of the, the fetishizing of Asian American and Pacific Islander women, which is tied to US imperialism and military occupation of our homelands. Um, so when I think about like, yes, like all the stories that we need, I want whole stories, like complex stories that acknowledge all of that, you know, that, that um, stop Asian hate requires also abolish ICE, that requires also, you know, um, that uh, that also requires decolonization, indigenous land back. Um, so I I think I'm getting emotional because I know that those stories are out there, and Firelight has been a place for me to to live into those stories and be part of those stories and in community with with all of you. So I'm so grateful for that. Um, but yes, to your question of like, what does it mean to be a storyteller right now? Like that is not that each one of us has the burden of, of doing that work alone. To me, it's like a comfort to know that look, look around at all the storytellers that we're in community with. And if we can all just carry like our one piece, like our one part of that constellation together, we have that wholeness and we can live into our, our complexity um, in solidarity with each other. So yes, I, I am both excited and, <laughs> and grateful. Oh, thank you, Ligaya and Kiara um, and Chloe for this question. Um, uh, yeah, I I think that, um, you know, what's already been said, I totally agree with um, something that came up as you were asking the question from me um, and this question of, well, a couple of things that came up in, in Jamaica's film and as well as in my film and what we're talking about, it's is like what has happened is, has been buried. Like, like we, as me, as a first generation um, person, you know, like I wasn't connected to what, you know, th this history, our history of where we came from, why are we here in this, you know, and it stems from this violent history of war and imperialism. And, um, and so that's been buried for a long time, but, it's starting to not be buried. It's starting to get uncovered, and and we're remembering. You know, we're we're starting to remember, and um, and I something that also is coming up as well, and I think it's also sort of been coming up in this conversation is, yeah, the idea of complex personhood, and um, you know, Eve Tuck wrote the open letter, um, suspending damage, and um, you know in that open letter talks about the idea of thirding and desire and um you know I think what happens is things get so flattened like oh this people don't have humanity because they're just this stereotype or whatever people think of a group of people and then everything's flattened and and then there's no other stories going on except for the that binary you know that binary is like it's just so damaging um, so to, to kind of bring in the third or, or the both and like all of this complexity. Um, and I think that's something that I keep coming back to in these conversations. Like it's so emotional. It's so, um, it's really heavy. It's a lot. And then, you know, there is, I mean, it's hard to come to a complete 
absolute answer like there, like and I think also in what you were talking about like with the split screen and the t linear time like we're all working in this system that that may that maybe doesn't even like have root doesn't it's not even imagined yet what else is out outside of that that linear kind of narrow dominant narrative um so yeah I think that um those are the thoughts that I had on this. Thank you so much, Maya and Lagaya and Kiara. Um, that has come to the end. Those are all the questions that I have. I'm wondering if there are any questions out in the Zoomosphere. Um, please use the Q&A box. No one's put anything in as yet. Um, and uh, I just, I um, really appreciate uh, if you could share the name and title of the S, the open letter that you just talked about, Maya, in the chat with everyone. That would be really, really fantastic. Thank you. No questions. Everything's answered. <laughs> We've solved it. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> um, again, uh, since there's no questions coming up, um, I just want to say thank you so much, Kiara, Maya, Lagaya, for joining us in this Beyond Resilience conversation, um, sharing your work and thoughts and incredible, incredible. Ferocity is going to be the word for me for the next week. Um, this was wonderful. Um, it, it, do you guys have any closing thoughts? Any other comments before we go? I just want to say thank you to everybody. And I wish everyone lots of health and safety and feroc ferocity. Um, <laughs> in the week ahead and love on each other and take care of each other. And always <laughs> My gratitude to you and Firelight for everything you do to champion all of us and all of our stories out in the world. Grateful. Yes, Salama, thank you so much um, to Firelight, to you, Chloe, Kiara, Maya, everyone who helped coordinate this and everyone who was listening in. I really, I, I didn't know how badly I needed this conversation until we started talking so so thank you so much for making this space and thank you for our beautiful community for being here much love yeah, to you, you all thank you for everyone who joined us 